ladies and gentlemen, our second fireside chat explores the future of learning and workforce skills, how and what students will need to learn to succeed in today's economy and in the decades ahead. Please welcome Dr. Michael M. Crow, President, Arizona State University, and Mr. Jose Ferreira, founder and CEO, Newton Incorporated. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and our almost afternoon. And so I just want to take this opportunity to just get this discussion going. Let me start by, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing sometimes when uh, you sit around and you do listen to over and over and over, particularly if you read the paper, just doom and gloom written by basically people that aren't very thoughtful uh, because they don't actually have much idea of what's going on. You would think that we uh, are a national disaster, that the country's being wiped out, that we're being annihilated by foreign competitors, that there's no progress being made, no innovations being made, no changes. No one's interested in science, math, or engineering anymore, if you believe the paper. Uh, just a little tidbit, our, our engineering school this year is at 17,000 students and growing, uh, expanding, unbelievable demand for, for the programs that we have, unbelievable demand for where we're headed, unbelievable change is being driven on many, many different fronts. And we've also found in the last few years through uh, work with companies like Jose's, and uh, he pronounces Jose differently, the, the Portuguese uh, uh, Jose. And so uh, Jose's company and others that we are on the threshold of transformative tools that will enable math learning skills to be uh, enhanced across our entire society regardless of where a student is beginning. And so. Jose, I want you to sort of start with uh, just talking a little bit about, about where you think we are. What's, the, what's the, the, the precipice that we have climbed and what does it allow us to be able to see? And where do you think we're headed with a topic that's on a lot of people's mind, which is numeracy or math readiness or math preparation or math capability to help get our workforce uh, prepared for the competitive opportunities that lie ahead? Well, so uh, thanks, Dr. Crow. So, um, Education is about to have its internet moment. It's just beginning right now. And that's, that's a profound statement because it's such a, a large industry and an impactful industry. And if you look at the history of the internet, every media industry got revolutionized by the internet without exception. And I mean media very loosely to mean anything that has a product that, that can in part, or in some cases in, in all, be um, sent, over, um, sent over the web or mobile device. And education is one such industry. And every other industry has gone and education will go, it's beginning to go. Uh, digital uh, video is another one that's going now, and those are the last two to go because they need a lot of, a lot of broadband, and so, so they're going now. But um, education is, is so titanic that the effects of that um, are going to be very far-reaching. Some of the effects are, um, when, you, when you think about how badly distributed education is versus other industries, I mean, there's not a lot of industries where you think, Sure, I'll just get up and move for four years and spend and just go elsewhere and give up my job in order to have this product. You wouldn't, you wouldn't go buy a car and, and move to another state for four years and not work. Or, or you wouldn't go to a hospital and move to another state for four years and not work. So people are used to this stuff because we all grew up with it. But it really is the, the, the constraints of delivering high quality education heretofore have been so great that uh, that it's, 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 the product puts an enormous imposition on, on, on users in a way that's about to lift. And it's going to lift in two fundamental ways, um, access and uh, personalization. Um, so, so that's the internet moment, access and personalization, both enabled by the platform and the tools that the platform empowers. Yeah, and so if you're wondering what to make of MOOCs or Khan Academy and the sensation that those were, and they're important, both of them, but Khan Academy is, a, is just a video library of 4,000 short video clips. And MOOCs are, um, have a 95% churn rate. So hardly anybody finishes a MOOC. So you, may, you might be, um, you could be forgiven for asking, well, why does anyone care about these things? And the reason they care is because of the promise of these things. It's not, it's not just Khan or MOOCs. It's Khan represents archived video of a fantastic teacher. MOOCs represent live video of hopefully fantastic teachers. It's, it's the promise of the world's best teachers can now be given away um, at virtually no cost in the case of archived video like Khan in the case of, or low cost in the case of MOOCs. So that's the access side, the idea that, um, that anybody sh soon should have access to great teachers regardless of their, of their socioeconomic status or the reality of their lives, they're a returning student, you know, they, didn't, they didn't get it when they were a kid but they can suddenly apply themselves as an adult. 
And then on the personalization side, companies like, like mine focus on data mining students because students produce a lot of data. I don't, mean the, I don't mean their behavior or anything. I just mean what they know, how well they learn it. We can measure things like that now in a way that were ne was never possible before. So we can produce just-in-time materials, just-in-time curricula. Now, that's a totally To the concept. individual. Yeah, to the individual. Right. So just give an example of, that, how that, of how that works. Well, you know, the current system, everybody has the same thing. There's two algebra textbooks for all of America, for all intents and purposes. You know, Pearson, McGraw-Hill, HMH. It's, I guess, three books for the entire country for algebra. Now, think about how crazy that is. If you go to the local Duane Reed, they have Duane Reed in Washington, CVS. You'll find like 35, 40 types of toothpaste. Okay, you'll find luscious lychee flavor toothpaste. You'll find whatever you want. Why is there 20 times a product differentiation for toothpaste than there is for teaching our children algebra? That makes no sense. And part of it is the historic capital constraints, the needs of, of, of the capital intensity of the textbook industry. Um, but that's all about to be lifted. And now instead of everybody having the exact same thing, regardless if it's good for them, um, they're going to get just what works best for them. As, and we're going to find it, because we're going to find students who are just like them. It'll be anonymized, so we can, we can not invade anyone's privacy. But we can take everyone's like, learning fingerprint, exactly what they know, down to the percentile. And we can measure how well they learned it. This kid learned this thing best in this particular way. Then we can take the combined data power of the entire network of millions of other kids who are, using, who are on the same network and say, who's just like this kid? And what worked best for them when they had to learn rules of exponents tomorrow in their homework? So go back in time, find people who are just like this kid, and say, control for effort, control for ability, and all you're left with is luck. Some of those kids in the past, by definition, did the perfect thing for themselves without knowing it. Pure blind luck. They just did the perfect thing for themselves. They got questions that were just like this, this hard, this type of question. They got teaching content that looked like this. They got the right blend of text, video, whatever, rich media. Maybe they learned math best in the morning. We can measure that. Maybe they learned it best in 13-minute bite sizes. We can measure that. So you find a group of people who are just like your child, and you say, Control for everything. What's the top 1% of people who, just like your child, but through pure luck, did the perfect thing for themselves? Let's find that strategy and give it to your child. And let's do that for every single concept your child ever learns. That's, we're, we're just beginning to do that today, and we're doing right. it at ASU. Right, so, we, so we, we learned some lessons in implementing these adaptive learning technologies, which is a, a word for what Jose is talking about. And it goes back to where I started, which is this notion of doom and gloom and so forth. And you know, we're all, the, 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 it's not going to work and so forth. So the one thing that we learned was that uh, if you took a thousand students and put them in a freshman math class and you gave them an adaptive learning option, that is they could advance on their own with faculty and TAs still working with them, it's not replacement of teachers, this is enhancement of teachers. This is allows scaling, it allows cost efficiency, it allows effectiveness, it allows new types of outcomes. What we found in the first thousand students that we ran through this program was that no two students took the same path to learning. No two students took the same path to learning. Once you know that, then you realize that the industrial models that we approach a lot of subjects with, the industrial structures, the industrial formats of just sitting in a classroom, listening to a professor, hoping to respond, talking to a TA, it turns out that that was the wrong approach. It was the wrong approach if you need everyone to move to certain kinds of skill levels. And so in our particular case, it was a significant and positive outcome that then has affected other things in which we do and other ways in which we work. Let me just give you a couple data points. Uh, we've gone from just under 9,000 graduates a year to just more than 19,000 graduates a year, while at the same time increasing our research productivity as measured by external uh, research expenditures by a factor of four in a 10-year time frame. So twice the number of graduates, greatly enhancing their diversity and quadrupling our research activity and our faculty is roughly the same size. The only way you can do that is by innovating and altering and adapting everything that you're working on, and, and Jose is in, is in uh, one of these tool-making, idea-making, concept-making, uh, paradigm-shifting companies. Now, you started to go in a direction which is, is, is something that I think that some of the purveyors of some tools uh, overplay, so I want to hear you comment to this, comment to this question, and that is uh, we look at, at these tools and these enhancements as ways for us to do our job in a large public research university serving a very diverse, uh, highly uh, fast-moving uh, metropolitan community in Greater Phoenix. Uh, we, we view these tools as ways for us to do more to achieve our objective, that is to serve the public uh, better, to constrain costs, to enhance quality, to work across family backgrounds and family incomes and starting positions and so forth to get people to these higher levels of, uh, of intellectual capability. A lot of people in the business of advancing tools from the private sector they have some sort of religious syndrome or something. They think that they are 
going to replace everyone else, that universities and colleges are going to go away, mm -hmm. and that somehow everyone's just going to take their little tool from Newton, they're going to go down to their basement, and they're going to uh, learn in their basement. So are you guys replacement, augmentation, enhancement? What, what's the tool? Uh, we're augmentation. Just like doctors weren't replaced by medical technology, they were, there's medical technology all around you now in a hospital, but they didn't replace a doctor. The people who think it's gonna, these technologies are going to replace teachers are, are, are naive. Um, the, the, uh, um, the, the factory model of education, it's kind of like uh, Winston Churchill's definition of capitalism. It's the worst system in the world except for every other system. I mean, we were all a product of that factory model. But, you know, it, it didn't used to exist before the 1700s where you, you, you turn schools into factories and treat kids like widgets. And it sounds bad when I say it, but it's actually the entire modern world is a result of, so good and bad is a result of that factory model. We wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have all the devices in our pockets if it weren't for that factory model. It affects everything. But it's, it, it, by definition, what they did was the, the rich nations, a few hundred years ago, decided if we, just, if we reduce as much cost as possible on a per capita basis from education, we can make it free and compulsory. And that was what was so revolutionary. Right? But the problem is you're treating every kid exactly the same. So now when you can treat kids differently, then what will happen is, for what we do, is the outside of class work becomes so much more productive. So the kids come to class, the teachers still do their magic in class. Teachers shouldn't be like lecturing on facts. We can the robot can teach facts better now anyway. Let's, let, let us do that outside of class with a personalized textbook that's personalized for you in real time down to the atomic concept. The kid comes to class better prepared. The teacher, the professor, gets real time data on exactly what the student knows and how she learns it best. So we're using these tools. We're using big data. We're using big data analytics. We're using assessment. We're using electronic advising. We're using intelligence, uh, in artificial intelligence based advising systems. All these things to augment our faculty, to be able to enhance their productivity, to be able to enhance the success potential of our students. And so we have an objective, and that is our objective is to be able to advance university where any child entering and meeting our admission standards, regardless of their family circumstance, their family income, or what have you, has an equal chance of success, that is, of completing the programs. And these tools work in that, in that realm. What about outside of math? What are you guys doing in other subjects and others in well, your space? You can, uh, so on the, on the access side, things like online classes, so you know whether it's live or archive classes, those can teach anything. You can teach a, bla a ballet cat class online, um, but the personalization side, person so the other side, that, that's all the internet does is those two things. It does distribution and data mining. That's literally all that it does. It just does those two things fantastically better than anything else that ever came before. Okay, so so distribution means online classes. Data mining means personalization. And on the personalization side, you can't really personalize a ballet class because there has to be right answers. So you can, per, you, you can create an adaptive curriculum for anything in math and science and, and history, and even writing um, is more amenable than most people realize to these technologies. But, th some, but because even a, a first year composition course in college, professors agree on 80% of it. There's a right answer, you know, topic sentences and main idea and scope and sequence. It's, but, but where there's no right answer, where no one agrees, that's where these technologies break down. They don't work. So you can use these kinds of things in ways to scale. So one of the uh, meeting that I was at uh, earlier this morning, at two meetings at the same time today, we were talking about the fact that there's uh, more people in the United States that have attended college and not graduated than have attended college and graduated in the United States today. Uh, that in, among uh, all universities in the United States, our graduation rate, that is those who finish, it doesn't make any difference how long, is under 55%. Uh, dramatically uh, uh, below where people would imagine it to be. And so then if you also look at uh, the last half trillion dollars spent on Pell eligible students to help them to go to college, uh, there's been no net change in the graduation rates uh, within the uh, lower half of the uh, family incomes uh, in the last uh, 35 years. And so these would indicate a need for significant innovation but one of the things that's kind of interesting is that people keep talking about the fact that innovation is somehow going to be, uh, the universities are going to go away, the colleges are going to go away. Uh, they're not going to go away, they're going to change. Some might go away that don't change, but they're going to change. And so talk about what's been your toughest engagement with the establishment education community. What, what, what happens when you start engaging with new adaptive learning technologies. You're trying to integrate these technologies into established learning enterprises, colleges, universities, high schools, whatever they happen to be. What, what happens? 
I mean, the biggest challenge for us has just been making people understand what they can do, because it just sounds like space talk at first, it, you know, and then you kind of explain it for a while, and then people are like, oh, yeah, okay, I can get that, I can um, see how that might be possible even today. Um, there's some political resistance on both sides of the aisle to, um, to change in any big industry, and obviously you're seeing that in education, um, and it makes for some unlikely allies, but, but most people understand these new tools are inevitable. They're going to be positive. We've got to be careful around managing students' rights, and, and um, but they're going to do an enormous I mean, relative good. to the big data and yeah. how it's used yeah. and so forth. Yeah, yeah. And one or two, one or two players in the space um, have made some rather clumsy missteps that have kind of accelerated uh, a debate. But you're not going to have the sort of privacy debate around education data the way you had it around uh, the you know NSA or Google or things like that because. Um, Consumer web companies like Google or Facebook only make money when they violate your privacy. And there's a kind of a tacit contract you have with them that, um, that they give you the service for free and then they monetize by advertising. And advertising, by definition, degrades the service and also um, um, it also violates your privacy. And, uh, and then they're constantly pushing the envelope on how much they do that because that's how they make more money. So education, to, uh, these education tools, they come online, none of them will use advertising models. They won't have that conflict of interest. It'll all be subscription-based. And the privacy, the, the, the student rights will stay with, uh, with the student and the institution. So, so, I don't, so there's a little bit of talk about that now, and, and, but I think that headwind's going to die down pretty soon once people realize that these tools are very powerful and some of those issues aren't going to happen here the way they did it in the consumer so, so, so in personalized learning, if all of us in this room, the people that are sitting here, were trying to learn uh, freshman math, uh, you would come in and you had, uh, let's say, eight or nine or ten principles that you had to learn. It would determine, that is, the system would determine, mm -hmm. uh, that you didn't know this and you did know that. You could work on these problems, you couldn't work on those problems. It would then say, well, you don't understand, it would say, Nancy here, you don't understand negative numbers. It would then take you back to uh, why you didn't uh, 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 understand negative numbers, work with you tirelessly to bring you to understand those negative numbers, bring in data from other students who also didn't understand negative numbers, look at their backgrounds, other things that they do know, classify you and begin customizing for you your path to master negative numbers. Once you've mastered negative numbers, using that as an example, you don't know what will happen in your head. That may be the switch that turns in your brain and all of a sudden you now have conceptual numeracy at a level that you never had before. And so once you have that, then your path to then completing the other parts of the subject uh, becomes your own unique path moving forward. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've talked about is the breakdown of these kinds of adaptive learning tools that are used in formalized learning environments like freshman math at a university level into merit badges or certificates or other things that industry needs. So let's, mm -hmm. let's turn the topic to, to that. So can we get basic numeracy down to a certificate that anybody could take anywhere and then prove to an employer that they understand numeracy. Could you go beyond numeracy to basic business math? Could you go beyond basic business math to basic statistics? And all of this is applicable for subjects more complicated than math, but can you get to this point using these kinds of tools where we could set national standards for employment, where you could prove your, your worthiness on these kinds of platforms and also be educated tirelessly uh, in ways in which it's customized to you? Yes. So um, that in fact, yes is an important answer there. Yes, it's it's near. It's, I'd say it's it's almost inevitable. So, um, so you know, we my company has a large uh, relationship with Pearson, which is the world's largest publisher. We have a large relationship with Houghton Mifflin, which is the biggest K twelve publisher in the states, and a dozen other publishers, and more every day. And so that gives us a, a kind of a viewpoint into students um, everywhere, and we can filter out a lot of data noise, and we can produce these kinds of national standards. So you can imagine. Um, so I went, to, I went to Harvard Business School. I came out of Kaplan, spent most of my career in, in, in education. I went to HBS for a couple of years. And, and you can imagine if Goldman Sachs in the future wants to recruit derivatives traders, um, and they go to HBS and you know, Wharton because that's what they've always done, um, you can imagine a, if, a, if a platform like ours could tell them, OK, you can do that, but I can guarantee you that the top derivatives traders in the country are coming from University know, of Cincinnati is where I think they're coming from. University of Cincinnati. And I can prove it to you mathematically. This is, these guys here and these gals here at the University of Cincinnati, they know more derivatives concepts. They learn them faster. They have them at a deeper level of proficiency. They retain them longer. No matter how you slice and dice it, they clearly know these concepts better. So, and by the way, they're going to be cheaper. So at some point, employment patterns are going to change, right? Because you know, Harvard is pretty good at everything. But it's, not probably the, it's probably not the best at anything. And if it is, it's, not the be, it's certainly not the best at more than a few things. right? Somewhere there's going to be a school that the graduates are more affordable. 
Um, fewer prima donnas. You know, we hire, we hire a lot of computer programmers. We tend to avoid MIT. I hope there's no one from MIT in the room. <laughs> Um, and we tend to get a lot from Carnegie Mellon, I'm sorry. The MIT kids, I tell you, they just want to, like, they come in, they say, you know, we just, I just want to choose the problems I work on. I'm like, what? You're going to choose the problems I work on because I'm paying your, your salary. CMU kids are humble. They just come in. They're cheaper. They're humble. And they'll, you know. And so employers are going to be able to make those decisions with data at large. They won't be able to make those decisions for poetry, but they absolutely will be able to make them for math, for finance, for accounting, economic. Um, computer, yeah, econ, computer science, for a lot of things that, by the way, pay some of the, they're some of the best paying jobs uh, in our economy. So we go now to, to uh, uh, the Marco Foundation's uh, run for the last 18 months or so, this uh, initiative on the future economy. And their goal in this initiative is to outline how we can enhance the net return to our society from a socioeconomic uh, equity uh, basis relative to uh, technology not uh, creating these huge wage disparities and how can we use technology to drive up employment opportunity, how can, you, how can we use technology to drive up wages and connectivity to industry and American competitiveness and responsiveness and so forth. So let's not look at derivatives, uh, MBA level individuals. Let's go down to uh, kids in high school or out of high school and they're trying to demonstrate and advance themselves in these things that employers really want. What about certificates and other kinds of things like that? Yeah, so right now for, um, you know, Germany's got this economy that a lot of us look at in terms of um, kind of a guild system. So, you know, it's got this, this middle market of companies that have a lot of, it's like a, almost an apprenticeship system. And, and these kids don't, go, a lot of them don't go to traditional four-year schools. And they go to these companies and, you know, a lot of them do between kind of 50 and 200 million. They're not massive companies. Um, and that's a big part of the, the bulk of German exporting is, the, is, is this uh, layer. And, uh, and we don't do a very good job in this country of capturing um, that employment um, layer. Um, and, uh, you know, Germany, I think, does a great job of it. I'm not sure, you know, because Germany is actually very anti-digital, I'm not sure that they're going to transition to, um, you know, to a digital version of this. Um, and I think the U.S. has a chance to sort of leapfrog them. We ne we're never going to build this kind of bricks and mortar guild infrastructure um, here. But, but you we think these tools could help us to do that? Yeah, in a virtual way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And do you have anything underway, or do you know of others that have things underway related to that? Well, we we um, the closest thing we had was a sort of a, um, a a thing we're working on with Houghton Mifflin, the Department of Education, to um, try to uh, try to um, intervene with at-risk youth who otherwise are probably on a on a kind of train track to. Um, to criminal activity, um, and many of them are in are in um, um, you know special juvenile uh, justice. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So that's the closest we've got. But, but yeah, I can imagine that a lot of people move into that space because with data you can find a kid who's who's um, you know if I can just get this student's math scores or you know communication ability to this yeah. level, right. they can have a perfectly fine career making eighty thousand dollars a year as a plumber. And the stuff we did at ASU, I mean. Um, you know, we, when we took a, a third of the students who were dropping out of ASU because they couldn't pass a, a, a first-year algebra course, um, and you should be able to pass, and it's not like it's not like it's advanced algebra. It's algebra, you should be able to pass that course to get a college degree. And so, so in, in our partnership, ASU and Newton were able to build a new course that that dropped that number by a third. It, you know, it's it's a it seems like a small point, but taking all those hundreds of students a year who thought they're ready for college, were told they're ready for college get to college and they're shocked and stunned. And the, the kind of the, 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 the vortex of, of uh, you know, disillusionment and, and self-confidence that they lose. You know, now it took us, a, you know, it, it, we, we can take another semester for some of them. Um, in some cases, it, we were able to tell ASU, here, we can get these kids through. And in some cases, we were able to say, if you give them one more semester, we'll get them through, but don't let them drop out. And we were able to save lots of those students who are going to now become you know, more productive members of the economy. So whether it's two years, four year, what have you, the you know, being, giving schools like ASU this data that can allow them to to save as many of those of those kids as possible has a profound effect on the economy, but also individually those those people. Yeah, it, it turns out that those uh, students were all predicted to be successful based on the admission requirements. I want to be clear about that. They had A's and B pluses in high school math. They had good scores on their tests, and then they come in for a level of intensity in the particular environment that we had, and for whatever set of reasons, including resilience and the lack of individuality or individualization, they didn't make the cut. And it turns out that of the kids that didn't 
succeed in freshman math, half left the university, and of them, three-fourths were lower income students. Uh, and so this is a huge transformation in our, in our operation, our four-year graduation rate. It's easy for schools, by the way, that handpick their classes to have high graduation rates. In fact, you wonder why anyone drops out of, out of an institution that handpicks the student and picks the student from a group of 20 or 30 competitors per student that they select. Why would anyone drop out? We take at our institution and at many big public research universities like us, those students who meet the qualifications to do university level work and they come from all segments of our society. Let me remind you that, that of the people from families in the lower quartile of family incomes, like the family I grew up in as a boy, the people from that quartile of family incomes, they have a 9% chance of graduating from college in the United States. 9%. That's unchanged since 1970. And so we're not talking about a person's ability. We're talking about their resilience and our ability to individualize the educational experience to help them. So one last question, then we'll see if some, there's some questions from the audience, and that is, uh, why was the company founded? Uh, why did you become CEO? Um, well, uh, you know, I'm an immigrant family. Uh, my dad came from Mozambique, and uh, we came to the States, classic American story. You know, my sister went to Harvard, other one went to Swarthmore, and, and we came with nothing but intellectual capital. And uh, every day it was education, education, you know, starting in fifth grade, what college are you thinking about, that kind of thing. And uh, Like a fifth grader knows. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and the system wasn't a good fit for me. You know, um, that factory model if you think about it for a second, it cannot possibly be the case that that system just happens to be an equally good fit for every student. Some kids, through temperament or upbringing or the way they think about the world or what have you, their own development, are going to be better fits than others. It's not that they're, one is better than another. It's just that we built this completely arbitrary structure because we had to because that was the, the structure that lowered cost per capita enough. And then we stick students into that thing. And then we say, you figure out the system. Right? And this system is immensely Byzantine and complex with all kinds of perverse incentives and, and con conflicting stakeholders and politics and rules that they don't understand. And we're literally telling these children, you go figure that out, um, if we tell them anything at all. And then the system, for the ones who aren't a good fit, gives them bad grades, right? which is a way of telling them they're stupid. And, uh, and it's, just, it's just madness. I mean, we can do better now. In this age, instead of the children having to adapt to the system, we can make the system adapt to the children. And that's why I started the company. Good. So are there comments or questions from anybody in the audience? Uh, looking around. Yes. Santa? Up here in the front. The president of the University of Cincinnati, no less. Congratulations on your derivatives department. Oh, thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you. So the, it's clear from the data for ASU that adaptive learning technology can have a real impact on, on retention success and all that. Mm -hmm. And clearly it's relevant to competitiveness of the university but also of the nation. Um, but being in higher education, uh, not all universities are like ASU. And, uh, culture change, especially within certain math departments, is, is not easy. Mm -hmm. But you said it's inevitable. So is it that you believe that the students will demand it? Is it that you believe that the governments will demand it, uh, state governments, for example? Mm -hmm. Is there uh, funding is going to be increasingly outcome-based? Uh, why do you say it's inevitable? Uh, it's inevitable because the supply side is going to produce it anyway because they're scared that if they don't produce it, once everyone figures it out, that they'll suddenly demand it, and so they feel like they've got to produce it. So all the publishers now are producing adaptive learning applications. We, we power Pearson's and Cengage's and Macmillan's. We don't power McGraw's. They tried to do something in-house. Um, and all of them, candidly, are not very good right now. They're, they're better than what they're replacing, which is everyone has the exact same thing, but they're nothing compared to what they're going to be in a couple of years. This, this space is developing very quickly. So, um, so the supply side is just producing it anyway. So your, your students are already using Newton-powered apps. We power my labs and we power mastering. Um, and that's just first generation stuff. The next generation stuff that we're producing is going to be way, way better. I can't wait. Um, but um, once people get the hang of it and they start seeing it, you know, it's, w Newton's, we're going to release a, a I, I shouldn't probably be talking about this, but we're going to release a retail application um, in a few months and it'll allow anybody anywhere can just go log on and start Those getting. There's SEC officers over there in the corner from the Securities and Exchange Commission. And now it's more like my PR people will be unhappy with me <laughs> pronouncing it here. But, um, but anyone can just go on and start learning some stuff. Like, what do you want to learn today? You just type it in. So we're producing a version that anyone can just start playing with at home. I need some homework help. I got a quiz coming. They just go there. And after a while, students in the way that you know, this generation just gets used to digital technologies will look at these things and say, but, but why, why isn't this adapting to me? Because that's what I'm used to now, and that's ridiculous. And they'll start being opinionated. And uh, yeah. 
you know, these and, and About 20 years ago, a, a science fiction writer named Neil Stevenson wrote a book called The Diamond Age. And in The Diamond Age, there's a concept of a thing called the young lady's primer, which is an adaptive learning conceptual device which engages the psychological learning profile of an individual and then works with that individual tirelessly. And it's kind of a science fiction-y oriented out, out, outlandish kind of thing. But this adaptive learning stuff, if you go back and look at the grid for that science fiction model, Newton and other companies and certain universities and others are advancing these kinds of things. I think, Santa, to your, to your uh, question about culture, at the end of the day, the public universities in particular have got to decide whether or not they're in the business of taking this broad spectrum of students and helping them to advance. And the private universities have got to decide uh, whether or not uh, they're uh, going to move in a direction where they're going to be able to be more broadly accessible themselves. Uh, with the more limited seats that they have, uh, but then broadening that accessibility. In either way, they've got to be able to find a way to become an innovative culture as opposed to a culture built more around tradition. I don't know where the microphone went, but somebody. Subhash uh, Mahajan, UC Davis. One of the principles of teaching is to involve students in their own learning. Currently, we don't do we come and give lectures, lecture to them, and disappear. The only successful system I know which has stood the test of time is the Oxbridge system, where there is a tutorial, you give the lecture, then the student meets with the, his, his or her tutor, discuss on one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two-on-one. -on -on -one. The only way the, the IT will be useful if we can create a hybrid of the current system where computers come in and serve, the, you know, complement what the teacher does in the class. This is not happening. If you go to complete IT system, the MOOCs and all that, you will create a class system the poor will stay out of the networks in the universities. They won't develop any networks. And the rich will go to the universities and develop the network and they subsequently build the affluence at the sake of the poor people or those who don't go to the university and network. So uh, what we have to do is uh, create a hybrid system in the universities where IT can create an Oxbridge type system. It's a very expensive system. The English universities, not university, Oxbridge can afford because all colleges in Oxford and Cambridge have properties all over the world. They get income. They don't exclusively depend on the federal uh, subsidies and all that. So do you have any comments? You probably have more comments on this than well, I Well, I mean, uh, Subhash, what you're talking about, this notion of it's going to cost a lot, people are done paying for it. So if we can't come up with a new methodology in which a smaller percentage of our overall expenditures are devoted to the higher levels of educational attainment, uh, they're not going to be supported because it turns out that uh, people are frustrated by the inefficiency of the system that we have. So I, I'm in agreement with you that this hybridization that is the interaction of the intelligent teacher interacting, which does not have to be always a face-to-face -face person. It often has to be that, but not always that. In fact, what we're after is that kind of hybrid. That's, this is an early stage demonstration of that kind of capability, just exactly as you're talking about. But it's not gonna be, it can't be expensive. It has to be affordable. If it's not affordable to the family, so the median income in the United States, it's unbelievable. What, what, you know, we have reduced minimum, median income in most of the states right now. We've got problems in, in affordability for higher education. The professors are becoming more and more uh, uh, isolated and separate from the way the rest of the society is working. And we've got, we've got to find a way where, where it's very affordable. I think we're, we've got no more questions. I'm being given the off the stage sign. So. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, Jose, who's here, uh, who's moving forward. And uh, I guess one last point is just to make certain that when you read the uh, newspapers and other publications and they say it's all doom and all gloom and so forth, well, it's not. There's unbelievable forces of change that are underway. So thank you. Thanks.